Thank you very much. Uh, I'm actually a bit surprised that you could pronounce my name so really well because it's a hard German name. Um, yeah, welcome to my talk. Um, it's about poisoned apples or the current state of iOS malware detection. Um, let me introduce myself um, first. Um, I've been working at the mobile security team in Deutsche Bahn where we had like roughly 300,000 devices that we need to secure from threats and whatever, which is basically outside. I'm working now as a security researcher or IO security researcher at uh, Trail of Bits on the iVerify team. You can find me on Twitter at uh, Healthy Driver, uh, which is actually without an A. Um, yeah, just say uh, I was not so good at English at school. Um, what are we talking about today? Um, so um, I hope every one of you has already installed 16.4.1 on your iPhones or your iPads because there were two vulnerabilities which have been actively exploited there. And this is kind of new. There was a time when Apple didn't even recognize that there were exploits for iOS or iPadOS or that even Maver might exist. Um, they started doing that with iOS 14.4. And they're even patching older versions of iOS, which is also kind of rare because they're only doing that for the actively exploited vulnerabilities or sometimes if they have some critical vulnerabilities that they like to patch. So iOS 12 got a patch at that time, and iOS 15.7.5 got a patch for these two vulnerabilities as well. Um, unfortunately, often more information is not available, so we do not know who has exported devices, uh, what have they exported these devices with, um, when has it happened, who is uh, whatever a target for that. Um, but sometimes we have third-party reports, and we're going to talk about a couple of them. Later this year, they also started to have threat notifications. Um, so they are informing people who have been targeted by spyware. Um, they usually get an, an iMessage and an email to their associated Apple ID. And if you go to appleid.apple.com, you will find some kind of a notification there. Um, they also tell you that there is some help available and they are referring to a third party um, web page where you will see some organizations like Access Now, for example, which can tell you how to do and gather some forensic data on your device. Unfortunately, and I didn't see some of these notifications by myself, but they're still not telling you what happened on your device, who have been targeting you and what did they found or did they found not. So you still need to go to someone else. Um, I've put together a list um, of CVEs, and these are basically all the CVEs which are exploited in the world, or basically Apple says they are exploited in the world. We found them in reports, or um, Google or someone else just told that they have been exploited in the world. Uh, we're going to come back to that slide later on. What we're going to talk about today is we're going to have a study of recent examples of zero to one click um, iOS malware. We're going to look at infection vectors, at IOCs that are available, um, what they did on the device, um, who found them, and of course the target group. Then we are looking at detection capabilities that we have with a sandbox app, with a companion on an iOS, uh, on a macOS, Linux, or on a Windows desktop, an MDM, or if we gather forensic data from a device. Of course, we're putting it all together, and let's see what of the malware we can find uh, in an automatic way, semi-automatically or even manually, and I'll give some hints on what we can do to further improve the detection of malware or where you can go and look for further research. Let's start with malware, and of course, if we're going to do it chronologically, we will always start at Pegasus in 2016, which was one of the first samples um, where we found like mercenary spyware in the world. The infection vector was WebKit at that time. It was targeting human rights activists and journalists. And the detection was basically made because there was one journalist who got a malicious link via an SMS and he found it suspicious in a way and he sent it off to some experts who were then looking at that uh, link, um, downloaded the sample or the exploit which was behind and that was basically Pegasus. It consists of um, three different vulnerabilities at that time, like the WebKit infection vector, an info leak, and a kernel vulnerability, and it was doing a lot on the device. Um, it dropped a couple of files, it dropped a couple of processes, it has uh, had a persistence mechanism to be like persistence if you reboot your device, so it was still there. It was also changing a lot on the system, and it was still iOS 9 at the time, so there was a lot more possible to do on iOS than it is today. Um, coming from away, but we should note down that we had URLs, files, and processes that we could look at at that time. 
And 2019, there was a campaign against a small group of um, people in the region of Tibet, um, which is called Uyghurs. Um, they're like a Muslim community. The attribution is unknown. Um, Google, who found um, that campaign, um, was thinking about that it could be maybe China or it made the most sense that it could be China, but it's still not clear until today who it was or uh, wasn't. Um, they basically found the infiltration architecture on the web, and this infiltration architecture was transporting a couple of exp uh, WebKit exploits, so they didn't find it on the device. Um, but they were able to um, download uh, the exploits, they were able to download the implant and analyze it further. And it was also leaving a couple of files on the device, it was talking to a couple of URLs, and it was also like spawning a couple of processes that you could look at. And I think it's like 12 to 14 vulnerabilities which have been used over like a series of three years to exploit and infect devices again and again and again. This one was not persistent, so it was basically just um, re-executing the exploit. The interesting thing about that one is, um, actually the malware authors were kind of dumb in a way because they were just pushing data out completely unencrypted over HTTP. So everyone who was do like traffic analysis on their device or if you have a proxy VPN as a company or whatever behind it, you would just see that there's massive data which is coming from your device which shouldn't be there to some weird IP addresses in, in a shiny spectrum there. So there's a modern version on that one which is actually doing encryption or did encryption in the past, but um, yeah. You could have detected that already just looking at network traffic. Then in 2021, we got the second version of Pegasus, and this one was actually much more sophisticated because it was not using like WebKit or Link as an affection vector anymore. It was using uh, iMessage, voice over Wi-Fi, or photo stream vulnerabilities. Um, so basically, you could not defend against that anymore, and you didn't need any kind of user interaction. It was found by Citizen Lab uh, Amnesty International, and some of the exploits were analyzed by Google Project Zero, for example, the forced entry one for the, the iMessage, iMessage Zero click. Um, and it was detected um, based on forensic analysis of infected iPhones, and they were monitoring the infiltration infrastructure, um, which they gathered like knowledge on the previous infections of Pegasus. Here we can see a couple of files, URLs, um, and processes, again, as IOCs in the report. And by the way, I put basically every report on the bottom of the screen. So if you do want to follow along later on, if you're getting the slides, you can just read the report, and you can also find all the IOCs which are in there. Um, they were also talking about a couple of email addresses, iCloud addresses, or, or Apple IDs, which have been used um, as, a, as an iMessage um, like conversation um, partner. But I don't think that these are like valid IOCs that you can really use because they can just change so frequently. And I would not believe that they're using the same addresses for uh, every infection or exploit there. But if you're doing a forensic analysis, and you will find that your iMessage um, process is looking up weird addresses or weird persons in a way, that's uh, still a sign that you maybe want to look a little bit deeper. Then we have an example, and this one was not in the, the sample that I, I said when I wanted to create that talk. Um, I, I missed that one. It was Predator, which was in 2021. And there was a report like a couple of weeks ago where Predator has been used uh, to target a meta manager in Greece. And they infected their device like twice in 2021. But it has also been used um, against politicians and journalists. And there was a recent report, I think like just a couple of days ago, that Greece has been exporting Predator to uh, the Sudan, which is like a conflict which just arose in the last days. Um, infection vector was still WebKit, um, but CVEs for that one are unknown. So we do not know which kind of um, vulnerabilities have been used there. Um, based on the report, it's pretty certain that some of them stopped, but it's just not clear however found that vulnerability who was uh, uh, working along with an exploit. Detection and technical analysis was done by Citizen Lab again. And we have files, processes, and URLs as IOCs. And there's a new thing. They're using a shortcut to as a persistence mechanism to start their WebKit exploit chain after reboot of the device. The attribution is Citrox, so we have like a, a third exploit uh, winner here in that sample. Um, yeah, and detection was again made by forensic analysis. 
Then we have a, a different sample, and this time it's uh, called Hermit. And this is actually a side-loaded app. And the infection works a little bit different. Um, it was uh, used against people in Kazakhstan and Italy. So usually um, it, it, they work together with a mobile operator. So they will slow down your internet connection or they will stop it at all. And if you try to reach your internet via mobile, they will display a web page which basically tells, uh, tells you need to download this application. And after you have installed it, you will gain access to the internet again. So that's like the standard Wi-Fi, whatever, pineapple example of getting malware on your design, uh, on your device. Um, as a site-loaded application, uh, it's an enterprise signed application, which means it's basically able to run on any device, um, but you still need to trust it. So there's a couple of safeguards in place, so you need to download that application, you need to go to your settings app, you need to explicitly trust that developer. You have to click twice there. And then you can start the application. If you would not do any of these steps, basically you basically you will not get infected. The attribution is RCS Labs, and the IOCs. Of course, we have an app on the device. We have uh, URLs, and we have a provisioning profile. And if we have an app, we have a process as well. And of course, we have a file. Uh, detection technical analysis was done by Google Project Zero, uh, Google Tag, uh, and look out for the Android variant. Unfortunately, Google um, did not analyze the implant or like the app and malicious behavior itself. So we do not know what that app is doing on the device with all that access. It was using a, a couple of well-known um, exploits that have been used for jailbreaks. So we know that they have kernel access in a way and that they can do a lot of malicious stuff, but we do not know exactly. So if anyone at Google might be here and might have access to the sample, I can analyze that. Uh, you don't have to do that, but I would be happy to, to receive it. Um, these exploits are actually pretty nice that they, they did, and there's an amazing talk uh, from, from INB at last year's OBTS explaining one of uh, these. Uh, or you can just read the blog post, which has like the same data, but that talk is anyhow, it's funny and it's really good to look at. Then there was a new sample, which was like three weeks ago. Um, it's called Rain, and the attribution is to the company which is called Quadream. Um, Detection has been made by Citizen Lab and an amazing report by Microsoft Threat Intelligence. They got access to the loader and uh, did also forensic analysis. And the infection vector is not really clear, but it's most likely calendar events. That's why Citizen Lab also called the vulnerability end of days, even though they didn't get a CVE for it because they actually did not know what the vulnerability was. We have a couple of IOCs here as well, which are files processes and URLs. Um, Quadream was shut down, I think, three or four days ago. Or they basically said that they are going to close down their offices, which sometimes happens with Spyware Company. But it's basically they just take the people, put them somewhere else, build up a new company, and then they do it all over again. It happens with NSO as well, um, and different companies, or with Hacking Lab. Um, so. I don't think that this problem is solved just because the company is shut down. But um, uh, yeah, Citizen Lab also um, contains something which they called an ectoplasm factor. So if the same people might be setting up the same infrastructure again and see same exploits, it might be still possible to track them in a different company. Um, then there's a report from Jam Threat Labs, um, which came out also last week. So it's uh, like. For years, nothing happens, and then the last weeks, everyone pops up with a new report of spyware they found. Um, they um, analyzed also uh, two devices. One was basically found to have been infected by Pegasus as well in 2021, and the other one um, is uh, still an unknown threat actor. Um, they did forensic analysis. They found a couple of files. They found a couple of processes. Um, the report is actually quite nice because it also um, tells you a little bit about the um, com Apple crash reporter plist file, uh, which is used um, if you have like urgent submissions and crash logs, which normally happens if you are on a beta version of iOS or uh, if something bad happened on your phone. Uh, it was an indicator of um, for for Pegasus at some time because, but it because it was always used, uh, also used in the beta versions, they um, didn't use it anymore because it also produces like false positives. Um, but it's, uh, they have some, some nice report about it. So it's worth um, checking it out. 
And yesterday, or maybe the day before, uh, we got the third version of Pegasus. This one is using three different exploits and it's working on iOS 15 and 16 on one. It's still NSO. They're still using false processes and a couple of crashes. And the exploits were in um, Find My. Um, there was one also in the image processing part and in iMessage again and in HomeKit. The HomeKit one is actually quite interesting because uh, it was the one for iOS 16 and lockdown mode, which is a mitigation from Apple for, for like targeted persons, um, was actually able to find that there has been something going on. And they notified people that there is some person who's trying to connect to their home. And anyhow, after 16.1, uh, this one stopped. So maybe the vulnerability was closed or maybe Pegasus uh, NSO figured out it might not be a good idea if people know that something is going on there. But it's like the first public proof that Lockdown Mode is actually also doing something against these kind of exploits, which I find quite nice. Um, they found it again, again with forensic analysis. Um, so this might be interesting to do it. And they found files, process, and crash logs, like I said. Um, there's something uh, in the l last reports, um, which is still going on today, is um, people start like they're not disclosing their IOCs anymore. Some companies do, some companies don't. Um, the reason for that is basically plain and simple. Um, it's getting harder and harder and harder to detect it. And if I have an, a private IOC that I'm not disclosing, uh, I can use that maybe in future detections as well and finding unknown things. And I don't give the spyware companies the advantage to know actually how I detected them. So um, that's basically the reason. But it still also doesn't give us defenders uh, the capabilities of actually trying to detect this one as well. So we need to work with Citizen Lab or Amnesty or whoever has a private IOC to do some detections. So it has pros and it has cons as well. Um, if we look at that slide again, uh, and I just wanted to, to like color code a little bit all the vulnerabilities that we have found in public reports, which have been used or like actively exploited. These are the red ones. Then we had a couple of vulnerabilities where we knew that, uh, like for example, iMessage has been exploited, but we didn't know the CVE. So I just um, counted these and I put these one in yellow. And even though they're not attributed to that kind of vulnerabilities, uh, but I wanted to have like a color coded picture. And it basically says there's a lot of white ones, and these white ones we do not know no, nothing about. So I don't think that these spyware samples that we found are the only one. I think that problem is a lot, lot larger. And it would be a good thing if Apple or who else is reporting vulnerabilities as actively exploited would tell us a little bit more about what is happening. Because it's, it's a hard game to actually do the detection, and every information that we get is uh, making it a lot easier for us. Okay, looking at these reports, um, we can collect a couple of target data that we want to look at or that we want to get. So we want to get an application list, for example, to being able to detect Hermit. We want to get access to crash logs um, for detecting Pegasus or some of the other ones. Um, everything which is in green is basically like a real indicator that we have from a report. Everything that in orange is sometimes, um, yeah, sometimes you get a crash because an exploit failed, but it doesn't necessarily mean to be that this crash will always be there, or the malware is trying to cover up their um, traces that they let. Um, we want to get access to files um, to basically being able to detect anything there. Um, sometimes network access will help us as well, and uh, getting access to processes might be really, really interesting. If we look at the target malware categories that we are trying to detect, we have, of course, malicious apps. Um, we have malicious profiles, which are provisioning profiles just for site-loaded applications. Or we're having configuration profiles, which um, also allow you to set up a VPN, an MDM, um, a malicious root certificate, and so on and so forth. So these configuration profiles are not real malware, but um, if someone tricks you into installing them, they can still get a lot of access uh, from data from your device. So it might be interesting to track them as well. Then we have known implants, which is basically everything where we have a known IOC for. And we have unknown implants. This is the stuff that is still out there. And we're trying to, to see what we can do basically with an app, which is Sandbox, an MDM, a companion app, and forensic cap uh, capabilities, what we can discover and detect there.
let's start with the application. And I'm going to start here with jailbreaks first, or like detecting jailbreaks, or the difference. And because it's something that we have done in the, la in the past for a couple of years now, which is quite common. Uh, I just wanted to have a short recap here. Uh, basically, there are two kind of jailbreaks, or at least in, in my definition. There is app-based jailbreaks, which are also called semi untethered They need an application to start the jailbreak. They need a kernel vulnerability. Um, and there's some public examples like Uncover, Fuga 15, Chayote, which I'm not sure if it's released or not released. And they're basically doing an exploit. They are elevate the privileges. They create a shell environment, and afterwards you get an app store, and you can run some tricks in Cydia. Um, as far as I know, the Fugu 15 or some Fugu 15 kind of um, jailbreak is already public or is usable, but it's only like until 15.4. Um, there's not an app-based jailbreak for iOS 16 yet. If you're talking about boot jailbreaks, these are all the jailbreaks that are executed during the device boot. They are tethered. Um, and in, in terms of like the newer ones like check rain or pair rain, um, you have like an unpatched boot room vulnerability that you're using to jailbreak the device. And on newer versions of iOS, you need a, a SAP exploit as well for that. Um, I make a distinction between these two because um, based on the process of jailbreaking, they give you different access to a device. If you're running a jailbreak via boot, you have um, more control over something like the boot arguments, which can give you a, like a higher access to an iOS device and you can disable some security features. If you're starting from an app-based approach, you don't have this kind of access available, so you need to deal with all the mitigations which are there and you need to find your way around that. You can detect both jailbreaks in a different way, and they will tell you basically different things. If you compare malware and jailbreaks, and this is basically a courtesy slide I will put in everywhere just for everyone who reads that and thinks that malware is uh, like a jailbreak and you want to detect jailbreaks, but actually you don't want to detect jailbreaks, you want to detect malware. And this is just the uh, small difference in perspectives. So malware is, of course, Attacker oriented, they try to use zero days, sometimes they use n days, they try to be stealth on their, your device, they don't want to be detected, they want to extract data and gain control, and that makes them really, really hard to detect, sometimes undetectable. And there's only a few known examples, and this is targeted for specific people on specific devices. If you have a jailbreak, this one is user oriented, it uses known exploits, it's open. Um, Oftentimes you have source code available to do that. It so should liberate your device and apps and give the user more control on that device and not the malware or so. It's detectable. You have many known examples in a mass market. So as any defensive company, you do not want to detect the jailbreak. You do want to detect the malware. Um, how is jailbreak detection done in 2023? Um, you have basically a couple of methods. Some of them are even not valid anymore if you have newer versions of iOS. Um, for, for example, the remounted root partition is not being done in jailbreaks, I think, since sealed system volumes or even uh, earlier before in, in, in APFS. Um, yeah, but basically, you have a chance to know if a file exists on the disk. Even if it's outside your sandbox, you cannot read that file, but you will get an information if that file exists. If that folder is readable by the user 501. You can detect um, if your own process is injected or is going to try to be debugging. You can detect some uh, injections in the shared cache or disable security mechanisms or protocol handlers like Cydia, Doppelbar, and Slash Slash. Um, of course, if you have a jailbreak on that, there's some measurements or some things that try to avoid that kind of jailbreak detection for people which still want to use their applications. Um, so that's a cat and mouse game if attacker and defender might have the same basically high privileges on the device. Um, what's actually worse about jailbreak detection uh, this year is still that most of the time every jailbreak is just um, reported as a jailbreak even if there's one event that triggers a detection. Think about it. You're jailbreaking your device with an iPhone XS on iOS 14. Then you decide you do not want to have the jailbreak again. You update your device to a newer version of iOS, and there are still some files which are still being on your system. So then you have someone who is doing a jailbreak detection because of that one file that still remains there and tells your device is compromised. 
you are on the newest version of iOS, there's no jailbreak available anymore. Basically, you cannot use your device anymore. It still says it's jailbroken, even though you do not know why. So um, that's actually a really, really bad thing of doing that. And frankly said, I see that in basically every company which is out there, at least for consumer market and also a lot for enterprise markets who is doing that, that kind of thing. If you want to do malware detection with apps, um, we can only use that... Well, that uh, capabilities that Apple allows us to do, which is basically check for the existence of a file. We can't read it, but we do know if it exists there, which sometimes can lead to a couple of issues like that common Apple crash report or plist file, um, because you can see that file is there and you might think that this is actually a malware sample, which is out there. And there were a couple of times which people try to fool some detection of Pegasus because still uh, at the first time, um, this one was, was one of the first IOCs. Um, yeah, but still, it's it's kind of good that you have that kind of capability. You can install a VPN profile or a proxy to inspect network traffic. Uh, you can't decrypt the traffic, um, except you install a root certificate as well. Um, but if you know the infrastructure, um, you can use that to detect infections as well. And of course, similar to jailbreaks, we can detect the absence of security mechanisms or manipulations of our own app. If there is some kind of, if a malware would actually do that. But based on all the reports that I've read since 2019, I don't think that any malware is doing that. And if malware would do that, jailbreak detect uh, detections and a couple of banking apps and games and security applications would have detected that also. And I would say we would have seen a lot more reports on malware basically detected by that. So I don't think that you can detect malware with jailbreak detection capabilities. So if we put that together um, within applications, we're able to get data from files only if we know the file pass. And we only know if it exists. And we can get network data, which allows us to do a kind of detection of known implants if they still leave a file on the disk. And like I said, only if we know that file pass. Okay, let's get to the next part. It's getting better, I tell you. <laughs> okay, now we're looking at a companion app on a Linux device, on a Mac, on a Windows, um, or even an MDM. Let's start with the MDM first. So MDM stands for Mobile Device Management, which allows companies to control certain behavior of iOS devices. That features depend basically on the MDM available and, of course, on Apple's MDM protocol. There are so lots of things that you can do, and I put you the reference um, on Apple's developer page to look at. Um, but we come to, to the ones that, that's interesting for us. Um, Apple's MDM protocol also works in a way that it runs in the background, so you get stuff basically automatically. You can basically ask from an MDM for the device to give you no data, also changes. And there are supervised and non-supervised devices, um, which basically the one is the, the distinction is... Um, one is like for being your own device, which is more like non-supervised devices, and supervised devices are basically for company-owned devices. That's not a hundred percent accurate and correct, but it's it's the easy main difference. There's also a nice page which will tell you the differences, what you can do with supervised or non-supervised devices. On the detection side, an MDM gives us information about the device itself. So we know which iOS version it is running on, which device it is. So we can use that also to tell people to update their devices and get on basically um, an iOS version which is not um, exploitable or which is the latest one. Um, alone with that information, you can basically um, block any jailbreak which is possible in companies. Just tell people to get to the latest version of iOS and don't buy devices. Um, which has uh, a vulnerable boot ROM uh, vulnerability. So if you use an iPhone XS or higher, you're basically good to go on the latest iOS version, and companies can get rid of the jailbreak problem for them at all. You can also get a list of configuration profiles, which are installed on the device. You can get a list of certificates. Um, you can get a list of provisioning profiles, and you can get a list of the installed applications, which would give you already the chance of detecting, for example, the Hermit sample right away, um, or any kind of side-loaded applications. 
Um, but in an MDM case, you can even do some kind of prevention because there's a couple of things that um, allow you, for example, to block the trust of any different enterprise um, app developer. In that case, basically, you can block site loading from enterprise developers. You cannot block site loading if you're um, developing apps on your own, your own developer. But you can basically could have blocked the installation of Hermit in that way. You can also force users that um, they cannot accept any untrusted TLS um, certificates, which is a good thing. And you can um, also uh, force users that uh, they are not allowed to install configuration profiles. This is something which is for supervised devices only, but this was also um, basically um, provide any kind of rogue VPN, uh, another rogue MDM or rogue um, TLS certificates that would be installed on users' devices. If we're looking at companion apps, it gets a little bit more interesting. And in this, um, in this way, the companion app uh, would be using Apple's lockdown daemon. Um, this one is used by Xcode, Apple Configurator, iTunes, a, a couple of other services on, on macOS. Um, basically, lockdown D will um, handle that connection to the device and the uh, macOS, and you can do it via a USB connection. You can also use iTunes Wi-Fi Sync if you enable that before. Um, and if you're talking to the device, Lockdown Demon will start a couple of services um, that can give you data. Um, you can use commercial tools like iMazing, um, or you can uh, use uh, free and open source software like LibI Mobile Device, um, which uh, is developed by Nikias and FunkyM. And I think Nikias will also have a talk tomorrow. So um, you should all visit that one. It's amazing software. It's free to use. Uh, it's open source, it's available for Linux, Mac, and Windows. So if you want to get some data of your iOS devices, uh, that's basically your go-to patch. Um, if you look at supported services, um, and that's from the LibI mobile device um, documentation page, um, there's a couple of services. I think that page is not really up to date. So it's still from 13.5. There's more stuff which is actually supported by the library right now. And I, um, at least for, for a later service, I fixed it, but I didn't fix it for everyone. Um, it will give you, for example, access to the installation proxy, which will allow you to install apps, but you can also get a list of installed applications on the device and also for provisioning profiles. Um, you know, here we have the, you know, we have, we can talk, for example, also to the syslog relay, which will give you some syslog information and a syslog stream, what is happening on your device. And you can also look for some interesting debug messages there. There's a couple of unsupported services. Um, and like I said, it's not really up to date because that, um, a crash, ro a crash reporter mover and the copy mobile service is already implemented. This works fine for 16.4.1 and also uh, older versions. Um, and it allows you to copy all the crash logs uh, from your device. And this will also contain this diagnose, um, data, but I'm coming to that later on, which is actually really, really nice for the detection of things. Um, there's also a couple of tools available, um, which are built in with Slip Mobile, I mobile device. If you install it via Blue, for example, which will allow you to do stuff right away. Um, and also this table is not that up to date because, for example, the iDevice installer is uh, also there, which allows you to do the app installation. Um, yeah. And you can also retrieve provisioning profiles, um, which allow you to detect uh, third party applications and that uh, syslog information. Um, on that page before, there was a couple of unsupported services. Um, I think that if you would look at more services, it might be that there is much more interesting data available that you can get from an iOS device that you can also use for detection. Um, so that would be also a good like research opportunity to look at that. So if we're talking about a companion app and an MDM, this will allow us to get an application list um, it will allow us to get crash logs and also to do some network analysis. Um, there's also a built-in capability with a Mac that allow you to get a basically packet stream of the data that is uh, going on on your iOS device, which will also use, uh, allow you to do some kind of inspection there. And this one will allow us to detect malicious profiles and malicious apps. Okay. <coughs> Let's get to the most interesting part. 
Um, if you want to do forensic on your iOS device, there's basically two types of forensic that you want to do. On the one end, you have file system forensic, um, which is done on iTunes backups, which you can get via lockdown daemon. Uh, and a full file system extraction, but you need to do a jailbreak for that. So if you do not have a device which is jailbreakable, um, you can only do an iTunes backup. And then there's this diagnostic information. Um, so these are the crash logs or sys diagnose information, which is available, uh, and you can use that as well. We're starting with the iTunes backup. And uh, this one can be created on multiple ways. You can use commercial forensic tools like Celebrite, Ecomsoft, Magnet, um, you can use Amazing. Um, there's a free version available which allow you to do a backup just for a single device, um, which works quite well. You can use iTunes, a Finder, or you can use Libi Mobile Device as well for that. There's encrypted and unencrypted backups, and basically unencrypted backups will contain less uh, sensitive information. So if you want to do a security analysis on an iOS device and you want to get file system data, always do an encrypted backup because it will contain much, much, much more interesting data that you want to get. If you want to analyze these backups, there's, again, commercial tools available, like that Celebrite and so on and so forth. Um, they will help you to decode a lot of data and display contents, but they are not focused on error detection. So if you're looking at a Celebrite image and you're trying to figure out if your device is going to be hacked or not, uh, I wish you good luck. I did that for a couple of days, but it's not useful at all. Um, because you're basically, you're surrounded by a couple thousand of files and database and if, uh, databases, and if you do not know where to look at, um, it's just not helpful at all. These tools are made for telling you if you have been at a certain place at a certain time, maybe you have committed a murder, or if you have had some documents on your device which you send somewhere away. So it's basically all about that legal forensic stuff where, um, which is more interesting in court, but it's not really interesting to figure out if your device is hacked or not. There's a couple of open source tools available. I really like um, the one that I put on the link here, which is in Python, which allows you to traverse uh, really, really easy through backups and look at interesting things. Um, but if you do it like that, um, parsing some iOS files like plist, SQLite databases, and the NSK archivers might be a bit more cumbersome. So you need to develop more stuff on your own, or you need to figure uh, figure out tools who did that for for you. There's trainings available which uh, can tell you how to do that. And I did the SANS 4.5.18, uh, which is iOS and macOS forensic analysis by Sarah Edwards, which is really amazing. So after that five days, you are definitely capable of looking at uh, all the file system data that you have on an iOS device and you know where to look at. Um, there's also one for mobile device devices, which is the 5.85 by Heather Mahalik. Um, but it also covers Android. So if you're only looking at iOS, this one might be more interesting for you. I'm pretty much sure there's a lot more forensic uh, training available, but it's the only one that I did, but I, I can recommend it. Um, since 2021, we have an amazing tool available, and that's called MVT, or it's the Mobile Verification Toolkit. Um, it's developed by the Amnesty International Tech Lab, and it's part of the Pegasus project where they found Pegasus and they released it for, for everyone else also to check their device. And it's created to make the iOS forensic artifact analysis a lot easier. It's focusing on spyware analysis, and it works on iTunes backups and file system dumps. It supports sticks to files for IOCs. So you can use it um, also if you have your own IOCs available or if you put in together a sample of data. Um, but they have already um, uh, a GitHub repository where you can find the IOCs from their own um, investigations. There's a couple of commercial tools um, available, which is basically just implementing MVT to check um, backups. And, uh, like Amazing is, for example, one you can also do that in the free version. But I think there are more one as well. But this one is easy to use. It's uh, also a Python script. And we're looking at a couple of the records that they're extracting. So some sample records are, for example, um, applications.json, um, which will give you a list of the um, apps. They are also looking at configuration profiles. You will look at shortcuts. Um, you will look at the interaction of applications. You will look at um, file paths that you're getting. But um, much, much more interesting is you get 
and information about processes that have been run on the system. So you can get the data usage by process, you can get network data usage by process in combination with a bundle identifier. So already these two information give you an information about if you have a process um, which is running without a bundle identifier, which is typically a bad sign on an iOS device. Um, you will also get information about where a process did start from. So if you have a process that started from slash private var temp, you're pretty much sure that's some, that's not a directory where you, you want a process to start from. So this one is definitely something which is malicious in a way. So this data is really, 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 really interesting. Um, you get also access to the TCC J, uh, database, um, which will tell you which process had had access to microphone, camera, location, so on and so forth. There's more stuff that they're extracting, but I just put a couple of the stuff here. Uh, you can find more on the link. Um, if we're looking at crashes and cystiagnos, uh, this is also where it gets more interesting. Um, iOS keeps logs um, of apps and kernel crashes, and you can already check these in your settings application. You can find it under settings, data and privacy, uh, and security analysis and improvements and analysis data. Um, you can run a sysdiagnose on your device, um, but you need to manually trigger that one. You cannot do that automatically, except you have a jailbreak. Um, for an iPhone X and higher, the key combination is basically volume up, volume down, and power all together for exactly 0 0.7 seconds. It can be a bit more, a bit less, but um, it's um, it will execute that one. It takes roughly five minutes uh, until you will find it there, and that screen will not refresh on your own, so... Um, do it, wait for five minutes, then go to the settings applications, and you can check if it's there. The file is roughly 100 to 500 megabyte of compressed data, and you can sync, uh, um, send that file via the shared dialog. You can um, sync it with iTunes, or you can copy crash logs with the mobile iMobile device. If you look at that file, you will see that there's massive amounts of sysdiagnose data which is in there, and this one is really, really interesting. Um, I could probably talk uh, roughly about an hour about all the stuff which is in there, um, but we're just looking at the 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 except from that one. So if you're looking at this diagnose, we're getting a list of all the processes. We're getting mount information. We're getting partition information. We're getting app names. We're getting updates from applications. We're getting uninstalls as well. We're getting information on iOS backups. There is an excellent paper available. Um, it's uh, roughly 72 pages long, uh, which just tells you about all the data which is collected from this diagnose. And there's tools available that allows you to pass that data. Um, this one is from the uh, Forensic 585 that I mentioned before. So if you're looking at this diagnosed data um, and the backup, so at all the forensic stuff, we're getting a list of applications, we're getting the crash logs, we're getting files, we're getting network data, and we're getting processes, which is basically everything that we need to do, um, malicious implant and sample detection. So if we look at that, we can see the forensics data, we can detect basically the malicious apps, the profiles, the known implants, and of course, um, sometimes also unknown implants as well. That's not surprising because we came from a part where we knew people did forensic analysis to discover these. Um, so it's good that we see that we can also detect that really. If we bring that all together, um, and let's go to the slide again. There's a couple of things that we can do in an automatic way. And that's, of course, everything which is based on an app and MDM, because if these are installed, they can run in the background, they can get data, and you can do it basically automatically. But you can only get apps and profiles with that, and sometimes known implants. In a semi-automatic way, uh, if you have that companion app available, and if you plug in your device to your Mac, um, you can also check um, all the forensic data, and you can check for known implants, and you can do that in a certain way. So if you have the right tools available, you can check all your devices for all the malware samples um, that I showed you earlier before. Um, you can also do manual analysis and try to find out if you have some unknown implants based on the forensic data that you get uh, got. And if you got a new manual file IOC, which is in a folder that you can check with an application and it's still private, you can use that to bring it up to a defensive application, which is on all your devices, and you can check for that infections as well. So that manual analysis could do a lot of improvement in the automatic detections if we find a new interesting file. 
if you put it basically in text, um, we have all the tools available right now to detect our own known malware samples. Some can be detected automatically or can be detected with companion app and forensic analysis. We have manual tools available to detect unknown malware samples if a device is compromised and a proper forensic and sysdiagnosed analysis is executed. Um, it's important to know if a device is infected or not, because what you're trying to find out there is basically a needle in a haystack on all the data that you have available. And if you don't know if your device is infected, it could be that you're looking for hours and hours and hours and hours and stuff and data on trying to figure out if something malicious is going on there. So if you have like a strong feeling that a device might be infected, it will help you a lot or if you try to analyze devices. If you're looking at a status quo of implementation in uh, companies, most companies will only do the automatic automatic stuff, so the MDM and the app, because that's basically available and broadly known. If we want to improve that, we need companion apps and tools to support the analysis and make them available to companies, and we need skilled people that can do an analysis. Um, I think that we have a lot less people who, who are able to basically do the malware detection on iOS. Um, it's roughly Amnesty, it's Citizen Lab, and it's a couple of individual folks, and maybe a couple of people who are working at private companies, um, but they are not available to the public. Um, and we need also tools to make that data uh, extraction analysis a lot easier if you want to scale this detection. What should you do if your phone behaves weirdly? Um, Contact an expert. That's the first and most important thing to do. Um, like I said, Apple recommends and just start notifications um, that domain. And Access Now is uh, it's an organization that I know and that's trustworthy and that you could definitely contact. Um, it could be that you're not follow uh, that that you're not a, a person which uh, is under their mandate. Uh, for example, if you're a business person, um, you can of course also reach out to Amnesty International or Citizen Lab. Um, they are the known experts in the field. And please feel free to contact us at Trail of Bits or I verify. We're happy to help you with any investigation. Um, you can use our contact sheet for that. Or you can just write me on Twitter or on LinkedIn if you have that feeling that your device might be infected. What can we do to improve the detection? Um, let's start with improving jailbreak detection first. Um, and basically, we do not want to detect jailbreaks. We want to detect malicious behavior, or better said, we just want to have different events for different stuff that is reported. So we want the jailbreak detection to tell us if there is a file that they found on the system, if they have a security mechanism which is disabled, if they found a protocol handler. And we do not want them just to tell it's a jailbreak and that's it. So they should differentiate between active and inactive jailbreaks, which is easily possible between app jailbreaks and boot jailbreaks, and they should validate their findings. Please don't tell me that you found a jailbreak on an iOS, uh, on an iPhone XS on 16.4.1 because you found a single file which still persists there. That's just bogus in a way. And I mean, if you're a security company, you should be the experts on the field and you shouldn't tell people that there's something based on that one. The data to check that information is uh, broadly available and it's there. If we want to improve malware detection, there's a couple of things that Apple could do. Um, of course, it's code quality and exploitation. If you have less vulnerabilities, there are less uh, exploits available. If you have more exploit mitigation, it gets harder and harder. But they're actually doing a really good job there. And I think since the ECR team started uh, in the last years to really improving things, it's getting harder and harder and harder. And this is also what experts like uh, Luca Todesco are saying. But what what really help us is getting some endpoint security capabilities on iOS as well. What we've seen from all the samples that we have, if we get access to a list of files on the system, if we get access to, to a list of processes which are running on the system and on the file paths that they're executing from, this would have helped us to detect any single example of the malware that we have seen there. So this capability alone would improve the malware detection on iOS like maybe a thousand times in a way, but it would be really, really, really helpful and we could do it in an automatic and an easy to scale way. I know that on iOS 9, there was this kind of capability available for processes. Um, I don't think that this was like intended. It was more like uh, some people use private APIs to get access to it and that's why it was closed. But it would be really, really good if you can get that capability back. 
And you can still do it with entitlements in a, in a way where you just get a certain set of applications or even use the MD, MDM protocol to transport that data. And you can still do it in a private um, or like privacy preserving way. Companies um, could, of course, start doing crash log and forensic analysis. I don't think that any major enterprise is actually really doing that. Of course, there are a couple of companies will, which will have the expert and they're going to do it, but the majority is not doing it. They could start using companion apps, which are not really available, but um, you could start working on that one. You could monitor your network traffic. And iOS experts and defensive companies start doing crash log and forensic analysis. I don't think that the majority of security companies which are offering mobile threat defense solutions are doing that um, at the moment. Um, you could start also training on malware detection. I don't think there's any single training on the planet available which is uh, trying to tell you how to do iOS malware detection. Um, but if you're interested in that one and you're looking for a job, I know that the Amnesty Tech Lab is uh, offering two positions uh, as an uh, investigator. And I think they're one of the best resources if you want to get training for that. And of course, um, if you're an iOS expert and you know the system, you can also start to set your focus on malware detection. Um, and try to figure out new ways on how we can do that. If you want to do further research, um, go on and combine EMM, MTD with crash log and forensic analysis. There's lots to gain there. Start looking at iOS backup uh, and syslog data. I don't think that we have covered like the majority of it. There's still a lot that you can do. If we come to a conclusion, um, I would say Apple's Vault Garden raises the bar for exploitation every year, which is actually great, uh, as they're doing a good job. But we still need more focus on malware detection, and we have to make improvement on several levels. Um, still today, it is not possible to detect new malware with an app on the device. You can detect some of the known stuff if you know that file and if you can check the folder if that file exists. We will need more companion apps for forensic analysis. We need an endpoint security framework on iOS, and we need more training and skilled people to do that kind of detection to actually scale it. So still in 2023, that um, citation from Ian Beer is still valid, and the current state of iOS detection mechanism or like prevention are still allowing um, threat actors the capability to target and monitor the private activities of entire populations in real time. And I don't think that this one is going to be changing in the next months or maybe even years. So maybe we can get capabilities to detect that kind of thing, but we cannot prevent it at the moment. So you will find additional information and uh, if you like to contact me on Twitter or LinkedIn. And um, I added a group for um, iOS spyware, which um, basically consists of a couple of people who are doing research, because my Twitter group for jailbreak and exploitation got already pretty much crowded. So if you want to be informed on latest reports, um, basically you will find a lot of information on the Twitter group. So which leads me to the end. Thank you very, very much for listening today. I hope you find it uh, informational and helpful. And if you have a couple of questions, I think we have six and a half minutes left. Yes, thank you very much, Matthias. We do have time for a few questions. So if there are any questions from the audience, raise your hand and we'll come to you with a microphone. I see one question in front. Cheers, mate. Great talk. Um, do you see the more recent samples trying harder to hide their artifacts on device yes. than the older samples? Yes, you, you can also see that in the report that they are trying to cover up their tracks and deleting crash logs and deleting samples from databases. Um, still, some traces remain on the device, but I think that's also one of the reasons why Citizen Lab and Amnesty are also like um, hiding indicators and keeping them private because they are really trying to get rid of all the traces that they're leaving on the device. Do we have more questions? I see a question over there on the right. The microphone is coming. Hi, uh, great talk, first of all. So I have a question. So you mentioned that it's not possible to, it's getting, it's harder to basically analyze malware through companion apps, right? But uh, you have these private frameworks, right? So isn't it possible to create an app 
all those private frameworks and all these private APIs that Apple doesn't allow, but you can essentially create an app, uh, put the entitlements, whatever you want, and then sideload it on the device using Apple Configurator and still do analysis? Or is there anything else that Apple prevents you from doing it? Um, you, you can still use private APIs, that's, that's for sure. I didn't look at all the private APIs that are available, so that would, would be a good research topic um, if you can get data out of that. But you cannot use like every entitlement without Apple actually signing it. So even if you sideload an application. So you're not getting like a, a broader access there. You can just use private APIs if you sideload it. Um, so is it, is it not possible to uh, put whatever entitlements I want, self-sign it, and then sideload it on the device? Is it something in the kernel that prevents those entitlements, or does Apple block it when you upload it to the App Store? Um, if you upload it to the App Store, it's blocked anyhow. Sure, yeah. Uh, um, there's a couple of entitlements uh, which you need to get from Apple. So you need to ask for that entitlement, and they will grant it to you, and it needs to be signed. So you're not going to, to, to get it on your device. There's a couple of entitlements which you can use without. Okay. Uh, but most of the stuff which is useful, you need to, to actually get it from Apple. So site loading is not an option here. Otherwise, we would not need JBREX anymore because with entitlement, you get so broad access that you do not need like a kernel vulnerability. Yeah. Thanks for the answer. All right. This is going to be the final question. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, what's your opinion about tools like Corellium for malware detection? Do you have any experience? What is your... Um, I looked at it. I think that, that one is amazing because it gives you capabilities of actually looking at the file. You can do um, traces of syscalls. You can look at movement of processes. You can even just breakpoint on the execution and kernel. So if you want to do malware analysis, I think that's one of the go-to tools to do it. If you want to do dynamic analysis. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matthias.